Thank you. Now, can you hear me at the back? Great, that's great. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I've been in the same position as you at ASLS schools conferences many times and um, actually had I not had a terrible cold which laid me low yesterday and I was trying to save myself, I would have probably come earlier to hear some of the, this, this, the talks earlier on. And I'm also very glad you've managed to stay till the end because I know what an intense day it is. So, um, <coughs> We've got half an hour scheduled, but obviously I want to leave a wee bit of space for questions. Um, I wanted to just talk a wee bit, first of all, um, about the form of the short, about the, the hieroglyphics which has um, been used for the National Five exam. I was delighted when I heard um, that the, the stories were going to be used. And I have to tell you that I only knew because somebody texted me to say there was something in the Herald. So I had no, no say in the selection of the stories. There's at least one of them that I would never have used for that age group. And one of the stories, which are hieroglyphics, actually the first one that I think should have been chosen, but nothing to do with me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very happy that, that, uh, that, they, are, that they are being used. Um, I think, obviously, you're all, can I just, maybe just so that I don't keep going off uh, doing a lot of unnecessary stuff, how many people have actually used the stories? A f right, quite a few, some people haven't used them at all, right, that's fine, that, that's okay. Um, in that case, I will say, I'll, I'll no, not assume anything. Um, <coughs> I love short stories and I love the form of the short story and I still write short stories, although I've later written novels. Um, the kind of stories that I write, I think, tend to be um, quite, well, low-key probably is, a, is a, a good way to describe it. Um, I see the short story as being come, formed around a significant event of some kind in the character's life something that will move the character on or make them co come to some sort of turning point in their, in their life, rather than necessarily being around a very large event. Some of the stories do have, they've got death or so on, but some of them don't. Um, in my stories, narrative voice is very, very important. They are mostly first-person narratives. They are mostly uh, in a Glasgow voice, although not all. And most of the ones that have been chosen for the set texts are in a Glasgow voice. Um, I think that when I'm writing, what I'm always looking for is the right voice to tell that particular story. Um, some of the stories are broader voices than others. Some of them are less so. One of them, which I'll talk about in a wee bit more detail later, has two narratives and it's the same person but it's that person as a child and as an adult and there are two different voices, one very Scots and one not. Um, and again, there are reasons for that. Um, a question I'm often asked about is why write in Scots or dialect or whatever you want to say, want to call it? And there is no real answer to that except that's what I do. Um, I think that when I started out, it was... And I don't really know why I did that, because I'd read lots of things in Scots. Um, but I started off trying to write third person and in English, and it never worked. Uh, and then I wanted to write something about somebody who was dyslexic, just because I had so many pupils who were dyslexic, and I thought, what a terrible affliction it is to be at school and have so much presented to you in a written form. And at that time, which is now quite a while ago, um, we're talking nearly, not quite 20 years ago, but nearly, there was much less understanding and less support. Uh, and so when I started to write that, I was imagining what it must be like to be that person. And the voice came to me in that Scots voice, um, in the voice which is the beginning of the story, in the, f the first story that I ever had published, and the first story in the collection, which is, and it starts off, um, the girl is looking at the, the words jumping about in the page and she says, I mind they were burling and dancing round like big black spiders. I couldn't keep a honel on them, for every time I thought I'd captured them, tied them together in some kind of order, they just kept escaping. So that was the first time I'd ever written anything 
and it just kind of kept going on it. And after that, that story was the first one that worked and the first one that was accepted for publication. So really, that was what inspired me to do more stories. Um, a lot of the stories are in the voices of wee lassies, and I don't really know why, but there seems to be something in me that anything between eight and about 14 is where it comes easily to me, and I'm not sure why that is. I like the idea of writing about someone who's around about that transition age, end of primary, beginning of secondary, because I think that it's an interesting age from the point of your development. You can be quite sophisticated and quite understanding of things, but at the same time be still quite childlike. So it gives a lot of scope. Um, a wee word about the sort of cultural and um, social perceptions of the language used. Actually, there is quite a lot in the stories about that. There are two stories that deal with that explicitly. And again, I'll speak about that in a wee minute. Um, I've always written in a Glasgow voice, except for my last novel, which Gone Are the Leaves, which is different. It's set in a medieval Scotland. Um, and I think that Glasgow, Glaswegian Glasgow voices tend to have tended generally to be perceived as suitable for humour, aggression or profanity. Um, now, I hope there's humour in my stories, but I don't think there's a great deal of aggression or profanity. I'm more keen to try and see a different side of it, to see it as a warmth. Um, a lot of the stories are very family based and also to see to use the poetic qualities of the language as much as I can as well. So that would be um, some of the things that I would say about it. Um, <coughs> if you are thinking about teaching the stories, now I'll say a couple of words, there are a few resources um, some of which are more accessible than others. When the stories were um, decided on, decided to be uh, set texts, I was asked to write uh, teaching materials for them by Education Scotland. Education Scotland commissioned teaching materials on all the set texts. I was the only writer who wrote their own teaching materials, I think because I had been a writer, a, a, a teacher. Um, and I wrote materials on all the set texts, which are on the Education website, Education Scotland website. They are not necessarily easy to find on that website. I believe they've changed their website a bit, but initially it's, it wasn't easy for people to come across them. So I hope if you are teaching them, you can find them. Um, you don't need to use them, but it's always useful to have something when you're starting out. There are detailed notes on all the stories um, maybe more detailed than you, than you need. Uh, <coughs> uh, however, what I would suggest is if you haven't taught them before, I would not personally teach them in the order they are in the book. The order that I would suggest is starting with All That Glisters, um, which is probably the best known of the stories. It's my favourite too. Um, Virtual Pals and Dear Santa sorry, not virtual pass, all, all that glisters, Dear Santa and Away in a Manger. It's those three all have Christmas themes. They're all based on young girls or, 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 fa or young children. Um, and they all kind of, I think, have some similar themes. And I think they're quite accessible stories to start off with. So I would say All at Glisters and then Dear Santa and Away in a Manger. And as I say, they all have a, a kind of Christmas setting. Um, <clears throat> then I would give your wains a rest rather than doing six stories in a row because I mean when I, when I first heard about I mean I don't know what you thought but when I first heard about how they were doing this I thought six stories six by the one author you know um, it seems an enormous amount because to me short story reading a short story is such an intense experience and there is a great intensity in it that to, uh, to end up doing six of by the one author is a huge amount but because of the nature of the exam and how they're examined on it, they have to do them all because any one of them could come up. So I would say, give them a wee break um, and then come back. The one that I would do next is actually Zimmerobics, which is the one about the old lady at the end of the, the, um, the, the story collection. 
It has some things in common, bizarrely, with the ones about the children. Uh, and that could either be done on its own and then another break, or it could be done with the last two. And I would do Virtual Pals and um, a Chittern Bite together. Virtual Pals is it's told in emails. And actually, when they picked it, I thought, hmm, that sounds a bit dated nowadays. But I think the feedback I've had from teachers is it actually still goes down quite well. And it's a conversation between a pupil in a Glasgow secondary school and uh, her virtual pen pal on Jupiter. Um, and it, it really deals a lot with language, issues of language, because the, the pen pal can of understand why this girl thinks that Glaswegian is not a, a perfectly valid way of speaking, communicating. So it's to do with language. And A Chittern Bite is a more adult story. It's written in two sections. Ma Mary, the main character, when she's wee, very Scots, and it, the story of her and her friend and a boy is paralleled by a triangular relationship in adulthood. But by this point, she's m speaking much more English. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to be taken out of that in terms of language. Also, to me, the idea of which is the more real and how, in a way, she becomes more distanced from her real self by her change in voice. So that's how I would kind of work on them. <laughs> Um, uh, what I wanted to do was just, um, as I say, I want to leave some space for questions as well. Um, I'm one of these people, if you don't ask me anything, I'll just keep talking, so make sure you ask. But what I thought I would do is, as I said, I'm, I'm going to... The first story is all it glisters, and I think there's no way in this time I can go through all the stories and explain everything to you, for those of you who have not read any of them. So what I thought was... I would read a little bit from All That Glisters and talk a wee bit more detail about that and that will hopefully help you to see um, some of the, the relationships. Um, <clears throat> that some of the things that I would, I would like to tell you are probably not necessarily things that you want to tell your children because it, you know what it's like. You, a writer says something anecdotal about how they came to write something and then they write that in the exam instead of what they're supposed to be writing. <laughs> but um, all it glisters, people often ask, why did you write it? It's a story about a young girl, Claire, who, um, and it's about a relationship with her father and who is very ill. But I never set out to write a story about a death at all. I started writing a story about glitter pens. And the reason I started writing a story about glitter pens was because I'd been, I'm a bit blue peterish and I'd been doing things with glitter pens actually for the classroom and they, they just go all over the place and the glitter goes on the desk and it's all over you and you go home at night and you're covered in glitter and you're standing in a shop and there's glitter all over your hands and I thought what a wonderful image. It's an amazing image for you know life affirming and, and the spread of it. It's a fantastic image and I thought okay we, as usual, we last were doing something with glitter pens and it, I thought, I don't want the child to be too young because if they are, there's less scope. But why would somebody in second year be doing things with glitter pens? And I thought, aha, it's coming up Christmas. Teacher's off with a terrible cold. Supply teacher comes in. Two days, I'm not going to start them in anything. Glitter pens. So that was how the story started. <laughs> and... The be very beginning of it was also inspired by real... I mean, a lot of the time I say, no, it's not based on personal experience, but you get little ideas from real life. There was One of my colleagues had been off, and when she came back, she asked her class who took them, you know, so that she could find out who had been taking them and off. And one of them said, oh, it was a wee woman. Um, and she's going, a wee woman? She said, it sounds like somebody just kind of was doing their messages outside and <laughs> said, we need, a, we need a teacher for this class. You want to come in and watch them for an hour? <laughs> so, so that's why the story starts with this thing. So I'll read you the very first section of it. Just um. Thon wee wifey brung them in. The one that took us for two days when Miss, Mrs. MacDonald was off. She got us to make Christmas cards with coloured cardboard and felties, which was a bit much when we are in second year, but nobody was going to say anything, because it's better than doing real work. <laughs> anyway, I liked doing things like that, and made a right neat wee card for my daddy with a Christmas tree and a robin, 
and a bit of holly on it. That's lovely, dear. What's your name? Claire. Would you like to use the glitter pens? And she pulled out the pack fair bag. I'd never seen them before. When I was in primary four, the teacher gave us tubes of glitter, but it was quite messy. Half the stuff ended up in the flare, and it was hard to make sure you got the glue in the right places. But these pens were different, because the glue was mixed in with the glitter, so you could just draw with them. It was pure brilliant, so it was. There was four colours, red, green, gold and silver, and it took a wee while to get the hang of it. You had to be careful when you squeezed the tube, so she didn't get a big blob appearing at once. But after a few goes, I was up and running. And when I'd finished, something amazing had happened. I can't explain what it was, but the glitter just brought everything to life, gleaming and glistering again the flat cardboard. It was like the difference between a Christmas tree skinkling with fairy lights and one lying dead and dark in a corner. My daddy was dead chuffed. He put the card on the bedside table and smiled. Fair brightens up this room, hen. It's good to find something that cheers him up, even a wee bit, because my daddy's really sick. He's had a cough for as long as I can remember, and he hasn't worked for years, but these past three months, he can't even go to his bed. I hear him coughing in the night sometimes, and it's different from the way he used to cough. Comes from deeper inside, somehow. Seems to rat his whole body from inside out. When I come in for school, I go and sit with him and tell him about what's happened that day. But half the time he looks away from me and stares at a patch on the downy cover where there's a coffee stain that my ma can't wash out. He used to work stripping out buildings and he was breathing in stew all day. Sometimes it was that bad that he'd come home with his hair and his clays clattered with it. He used to kid on he was a ghost and walk in the house with his arms stretched out afore him and I'd run and hide under the stair watch him walk by with the fine powdery whiteness floating round his head. He never knew there was asbestos in the dust. Never knew a thing about it then. None of them did. Now he's an expert on it. Read up all these books to try and understand it for the compensation case. Before he got really sick, he used to talk about it sometimes. You see, Hen, the word asbestos comes from a Greek word that means indestructible. That's how they use it for fireproofing. The fire can't destroy it. You mean if you wore an asbestos suit, you could walk through fire and it wouldn't hurt you? Aye. In the olden days, they used to bury the royals in it. They cried it the funeral dress of kings. So that's the beginning of the story. And as I said, it, it arose almost out of nowhere. The first part of it was just playing with glitter pens. And then when she got home and the dad's not well, and all of a sudden it was just, oh, oh oh, no, he's really sick. And it's as, almost as if it just kind of happened. Um, the asbestos part of it as well was almost out of nowhere. But, of course, what it does in, this, in the story is it provides a very important contrasting image between the, the glitter, which gets everywhere and is life-affirming, and asbestos, which also gets everywhere but is death, but equally is invisible, basically. It's in the... Stewart, but you don't know it's there. Um, so that, that the story kind of developed from there. Now I have to say that although Maureen has said that our classes were in tears and it, uh, you know it, it, there is sadness in it, it does not end with the dad's death in that sense and it's really to do with the way that their relationship is and how these things can you know go beyond someone's death. Um, so I'll leave you to read that one if you want to. Um, I think the idea of the symbolism is very important in my stories. There's a lot of symbolism. Uh, and that's something, again, which your pupils can you know, write about quite a lot. Uh, I don't know if there's anything especially in that one that I, that I particularly can say. Um, I'm not, I, I know that we're kind of short on time, so I'm not going to say too much more about the stories in detail, except that the other two, Dear Santa is about uh, the opposite. There's the the parent-child relationship in All That Glisters is very strong. Obviously, the father relationship with Claire is very strong. The mother, all, there's the mother also, they all have a strong relationship. And it's that is a big part of the story. And it's also a big part in quite a lot of the stories. Um, in Dear Santa, and whenever... I have to say that whenever they told, they, they, I was looking at the stories again to write the, 
the materials. My first thought was, how did I write that? It's the most miserable. How on earth could I have written that story? Um, it's, a, it's about the opposite. It's actually about a young girl. She's much younger. She's about eight. And she thinks that her mother loves her sister more than her. Um, and so there's a, a parent-child relationship in it, but it is a much more dark, more complex relationship. And looking back on why did, why did I write it again, it's not something you necessarily tell all your pupils, but I think at the time when I wrote it, there were several articles that I'd read in newspapers, and it was about uh, the idea that parents not always loving their children the same or having a favourite or that kind of thing. And I, and I was just thinking in my head, what is that like? to have that, you know, to have that feeling that, because I mean, I know that we, you know, anybody who has a brother or sister, we know that when we were we, we thought, well, how did he come? He got that and I never got it. Or how come she's got that and I never got it or whatever it might be. Um, I even, one of my friends, her sister um, was about, there was three of them in a kind of block. And then there was a sister, it was about 10 years later. And you know how if you've got a lot of children, the first one gets all the photos taken and then the next one gets less and less and less. And if one time her, she actually went to her, her mum or her dad or somebody and went, tell me the truth, am I adopted? Because there were no photos of her when we were a baby. But that was, I mean, I don't think she seriously thought that, you know, people didn't love her. But anyway, the second story is to do with that. But it's also, but she's writing to Santa about it. And it is a kind of a sad wee story, um, which again, I don't know, it's entirely typical, but it fits in the theme, family relationships. Away in a manger, um, the third story I would suggest doing is set at Christmas time. And it's a mum taking her wee five-year-old in to see the Christmas lights and they see a homeless person, so there's a theme of homelessness there, they come across a homeless person. And that was also inspired by walking through George Square. Uh, and of course, there used to always be lots of people, there are more homeless people now than there were when that story was there. But it's that thing of just, you know, feeling, you know, Christmas and everything's really happy and then you see these folk and you think, this is just really terrible. But as adults, we compromise Whereas a five-year-old will say, well, why can't we just take them home? You know, we've got a spare room, you know, why don't we just bring them home? And it's really to do with that relationship with it. But it's the relationship, the love between parent and child as well as homelessness. Um, Zim Aerobics is about an elderly lady in a, in a home who has kind of given up on life until a young woman comes along and does um, exercise classes with them. Zim aerobics, they can use their zimmers. I'm sure there probably is a class for Zim aerobics now, but at the time I just thought, I, I'd noticed lots of aerobics classes around with funny names about this kind of aerobics and that kind of aerobics, and I thought, you know, and I had an elderly aunt, and I used to think, what about Zim aerobics? That would be really great. So I wrote the story about Zim aerobics. It may sound as if it's not got much in common with the other stories, but I think the idea of not stereotyping people is really strong in a lot of the stories. Just because she's an old lady, why do we assume that she wants to do certain things? Um, and also, in a sense, at the end, she kind of triumphs in the way that some of the characters do at the end. Um, Virtual Pals, I've mentioned, it's the one with the emails and the, 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 um, the two the two girls, and a chitter and bite, which is the one I would never have put in, but I've had feedback from some teachers who say actually it goes down very well. Um, and it's really to do, it's very much to do with language and how often folk who speak in a Scots or accent when they're wee, it gets kind of educated out of them. And it's to do with that distancing. The imagery in it, I think, is deliberately focused very much on, as a child, it's in very much in the senses, it's feeling, hearing, smelling, tasting. As an adult, it's very distanced, it's very visual, but she's not as engaged in that. That was a bit of a race through. Um, I have some, I would suggest as well, I'd like people's questions if anybody's got any energy to ask me anything now. Um, as far as resources are concerned, one of the things that's disappointed me is that I did when I knew the stories were coming out, I asked my publisher, because they have copyright, if I could record some of the stories. And I did record some of them, and they are up um, on uh, my web, the, the Canongate website on SoundCloud. 
and it could be a useful resource. Some of you might be perfectly comfortable reading in a Glasgow, Glaswegian voice, you might not, but equally if a pupil is absent or they want to do it for homework, it's freely available, you can download it or listen to it or whatever, they can find it on their phone, anything at all. There is a great big long, long link, and I can't, there's anywhere for me to write it down, but I think basically if you look up Canon Gate, which is, I think it's Canon Gate TV, is their website, look for audio files, and it's SoundCloud, and if you put in and on, I mean, you should be able to find it. There's if it will become under hieroglyphics, but there are recordings of the first three that I mentioned, all at Glister's, Dear Santa and um, Away in a Manger. There's also a wee snippet from the first part of my new novel, uh, Gone Are the Leaves, is, is up on SoundCloud as well. I, for the last, I don't know how long, I've been trying to get a website of my own together, and every time, it's almost there, but every time it's about to go up, some mysterious thing happens that it doesn't go up. Eventually, I hope to put links up to it. Um, so at, at some point, I'll get that. Um, the other thing that I think is quite useful is um, there's a BBC, there was a BBC programme, a schools programme on all the glisters, along with several others, and you may actually have it knocking about in the department on an old video or something. Um, bec I can't remember what year it was. It might have been about two, mm, 2006, six, seven, or something like that. I was interviewed in it. There were three short stories uh, on it, Scottish ones. But if you look, it's on the BBC website. Uh, it's BBC, it's bbc.co.uk, it's Learning Zone Clips. And if you look for short Scottish short stories, you should be able to find at least a clip out of it. I don't think the whole programme is up. The other um, thing I would suggest, and this is as an extra, but um, a, an animated uh, animation filmmaker called Claire Lamond did a lovely animated version of All It Glisters, and it'd be a nice thing to show your pupils. Um, if you look for Claire's website, it's just Claire Lamond. If you search Claire Lamond, her website, you'll find clips from her films. And the, the nice thing about it is it's all done with puppets, and she makes, she made all the puppets. And it's just a really, really nice wee film, um, and a different way of, of looking at the things. So I hope that's helpful, and please ask some questions if there's a few minutes left.